Once upon a time, there was a city, and all its inhabitants were blind. A king with his entourage arrived in the city and camped nearby. He had a mighty elephant in his army, which he used to increase the people's awe. The inhabitants of the blind city wanted to see the elephant, and some of them ran like fools to find it. As they did not know the form or shape of the elephant, they groped sightlessly, gathering information by touching some part of it. Each thought that he knew something because he could feel a part. The man whose hand had reached an ear said, It is a large rough thing, wide and broad like a rug. And the one who had felt the trunk said, I have the real facts about it. It is like a straight and hollow pipe, awful and destructive. The one who had felt its feet and legs said, It is mighty and firm, like a pillar. Each had felt one part out of many, and each had perceived it wrongly. This ancient Sufi story teaches a simple lesson, but one that we often ignore. The behavior of a system cannot be known just by knowing the elements of which the system is made. And it is a powerful analogy for one of the most potent problems we face in modernity. Conventional reductionist or linear thinking works for simple everyday linear problems, such as when you cut your hand and put on a band-aid to help the cut heal. It is also the basis for how most of us were taught in school and still tend to think. Divide the world into specific disciplines and problems into their components under the assumption that we can best address the whole by focusing on and optimizing the parts. If we run out of milk, we need to buy more milk. And if the car runs out of gas, we need to refuel it. If our stomach is growling, we need to eat. These are easy to fix problems that do not require a meta-analysis to be fixed, right? What about the non-linear problems that cannot be fixed with a cause-effect analysis, however? What is a non-linear problem anyways? For example, predator and prey relationships such as rabbits overpopulating or there being more crop-eating insects one year after an effective cleansing with pesticides. Why do certain species go extinct? Market reactions are also notoriously non-linear. Why is the market reacting better or worse to a new product in certain months? How could we explain with the same logic the multidisciplinary changes nuclear power plants create? How could we say, matter-of-factly, that if the nuclear reactor releases heat, the spawning habits of fish will change? Can we explain this phenomenon purely through biology or chemistry or physics? No, we cannot give a proper explanation with a reductionist monodisciplinary approach. Complex socio-economic issues like legalizing marijuana, gay marriage or gun control laws are also non-linear simple. Just because this happened, we will do that kind of thinking, or worse, apply problem-solving attempts that produce serious consequences. Any change in these matters affects many actors differently. The benefit of one actor may be the loss of another actor. How can you find a common ground with everybody? In some ways, the 20th century science was marked by the demise of the reductionist dream. In spite of its great successes explaining the very large and very small, fundamental physics and more generally, scientific reductionism has been notably mute in explaining the complex phenomena closest to our human scale concerns. Many phenomena have stymied the reductionist program. The seemingly irreducible unpredictability of weather and climate, the intricacies and adaptive nature of living organisms and the diseases that threaten them, the economic, political and cultural behavior of societies, the growth and effects of modern technology and communication networks, and the nature of intelligence and the prospect for creating it in computers. The anti reductionist catchphrase, the whole is more than the sum of its parts, takes on increasing significance. You cannot do anything with knowledge unless you know where it stops and the costs of using it. Post Enlightenment science and its daughter superstar science were lucky to have done well in linear physics, chemistry, and engineering. But at some point, we need to give up on elegance to focus on something that has been overlooked for a very long time. The maps showing what current knowledge and current methods do not do for us. We need a new level, a deeper level of thinking, a paradigm based on the principles that accurately describe the territory of effective human being and interacting to solve these deep concerns. If we create more robust mental models to represent the world, elements hidden in the texture of reality start staring at us, and then mysteries that we never thought existed emerge in front of our eyes. This new level of thinking with respect to our current problems requires us to appreciate a situation we want to change through a systemic instead of a conventional lens. The first step in moving away from linear thinking to systems thinking is to decide if something is actually the problem or simply a symptom of something deeper. 
Linear analytical thinking is usually concerned with focusing on symptoms. It tends to stay on the surface to examine behaviors and search for clear cause and effect relationships instead of digging deeper to find the true problem before correcting the symptoms. Systems thinking, on the other hand, is characterized by a thought process as follows. A cloud amasses, the sky darkens, leaves to upward, and we know that it will rain. We also know that the storm runoff will feed into groundwater miles away and the sky will clear by tomorrow. All these events are distant in time and space and yet they are all connected within the same pattern. Each has an influence on the rest, an influence that is usually hidden from view. You can only understand the system of a rainstorm by contemplating the whole, not any individual part of the pattern. Business and other human endeavors are also systems. They too are bound by invisible fabrics of interrelated actions, which often take years to fully play out their effects on each other. Since we are part of that lacework ourselves, it is doubly hard to see the whole pattern of change. Instead, we tend to focus on snapshots of isolated parts of the system and wonder why our deepest problems never seem to get solved. Systems thinking is a conceptual framework, a body of knowledge and tools that has been developed over the last century to make the full patterns clearer and to help us see how to change them effectively. Though the tools are new, the underlying worldview is extremely intuitive and experiments with young children show that even they learn systems thinking very quickly. This allays the fear that a systems lens is too sophisticated and beyond most people's reach. It is quite literally child's play. The word paradigm has a Greek origin. It means the way we see the world, not in terms of our visual sense of sight, but in terms of perceiving, understanding, interpreting. The more aware we are of our basic paradigms, maps or assumptions, and the extent to which we have been influenced by our experience, the more we can take responsibility for those paradigms, examine them, test them against reality, listen to others and be open to their perceptions, thereby getting a larger picture and a far more objective view. The term paradigm shift was introduced by Thomas Kuhn in his highly influential landmark book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Kuhn shows how almost every significant breakthrough in the field of scientific endeavor is first a break with tradition, with old ways of thinking and with old paradigms. For Ptolemy, the great Egyptian astronomer, the Earth was the center of the universe, but Copernicus created the paradigm shift and a great deal of resistance and persecution as well by placing the Sun at the center. Suddenly, everything took on a different interpretation. The Newtonian model of physics was a clockwork paradigm and is still the basis of modern engineering, but it was partial and incomplete. The scientific world was revolutionized by the Einsteinian paradigm, the relativity paradigm, which had much higher predictive and explanatory value. Until the germ theory was developed, a high percentage of women and children died during childbirth, and no one could understand why. In military skirmishes, more men were dying from small wounds and diseases than from the major traumas on the front lines. But as soon as the germ theory was developed, a whole new paradigm, a better, improved way of understanding what was happening, made more dramatic, significant medical improvement possible. The United States today itself is the fruit of a paradigm shift. The traditional concept of government for centuries had been a monarchy, the divine right of kings. Then, a different paradigm was developed, government of the people, by the people, and for the people and a constitutional democracy was born, unleashing tremendous human energy and ingenuity and creating a standard of living, of freedom and liberty, of influence and hope unequal in the history of the world. In summary, paradigm shifts move us from one way of seeing the world to another and those shifts create powerful change. Systems thinking is a paradigm shift from our more traditional thinking patterns because we have been taught to look at things rationally and to try to look for clear cause and effect connections. We are now used to trying to study things in small digestible pieces and to attempting to solve problems as quickly as possible by taking control of situations around us. Quite often, we focus on external sources as the cause of all of our problems instead of looking internally at our systems to see what improvements can be made. But systems thinking takes a different approach. When we think in systems, we slow down and dig deeper trying to find solutions and explanations to given phenomena. Systems thinking encourages us to look at events and patterns that occur in our lives and around us by focusing on the connection and relationship between the system's parts instead of only looking at the individual parts in isolation. It encourages observing the interconnections of the parts. Systems thinking leads us away from trying to come up with a quick fix to a problem in favor of considering the long-term consequences 
our actions may cause. It supports a deeper level of understanding than we typically take the time to see. The term systems thinking itself was coined by Barry Richman in 1987. According to Richman, systems thinking is the art and science of making reliable inferences about behavior by developing an increasingly deep understanding of underlying structure. And in the fifth discipline field book, author Peter Sands states, systems thinking is a way of thinking about and a language for describing and understanding the forces and interrelationships that shape the behavior of systems. This discipline helps us to see how to change systems more effectively and to act more in tune with the natural processes of the natural and economic world. In order to get a better understanding of what these two experts are telling us, let us go back to the basics. What is a system? A system is a group of things, people, cells, molecules or whatever interconnected in such a way that they produce their own pattern of behavior over time. The system may be buffeted, constricted, triggered or driven by outside forces but the system's response to these forces is a characteristic of itself and that response is seldom simple in the real world. This is a central insight of systems theory and it is effectively illustrated by something like the behavior of a toy slinky, a long loose spring that can be made to bounce up and down or pour back and forth from hand to hand or walk itself downstairs. If you perch a slinky on an upturned palm, grasp it from the top with the fingers of the other hand and then pull the bottom hand away, the lower end of the slinky drops, bounces back up again, yo-yos up and down. What makes the slinky bounce up and down like that? If you perform the same series of actions on the box the slinky was packaged in, nothing happens. The box just hangs there of course. The answer clearly lies within the slinky itself. The hands that manipulate it suppress or release some behavior that is latent within the structure of the spring. Once we see the relationship between structure and behavior, we can begin to understand how systems work, what makes them produce poor results, and how to shift them into better behavior patterns. To conclude, I firmly believe that the holistic systems lens is humanity's most invaluable tool to manage, adapt, and see the wide range of choices we have before us to deal with the increasingly complex problems we face such as climate change, world poverty, financial crises, immigration, and drug abuse that have stymied the reductionist paradigm. It is a way of thinking that gives us the freedom to identify root causes of problems and see new opportunities.